Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host and we have quite a few things to talk about on this episode. Pukakoi, the ITM Auckland 400 was the round just gone in New Zealand. And boy, was it the scene of a, a lot of controversy. A lot of things happened. A lot of things went down. So let's start by talking about the race results. Where else are we going to go? So we'll start with the Saturday qualifying session. Not a huge amount happened in this. Um, there wasn't any serious incidents, I think. Uh, Simona caused a red flag and had her time deleted for going off at turn three, which is the uh, initial chicane. A lot of people went off there. In fact, Scott McLaughlin went off there during practice and crashed and they had to repair his car but the times or the positions achieved in qualifying which remember on saturday there was no top 10 shootout just qualifying determines the order the time the positions i keep saying times the positions went as follows scott mclaughlin in first followed by shane van gisbergen first and second in the championship first and second on the grid what a story that was David Reynolds in third, Chaz Monster in fourth, Jamie Winkup in fifth, Nick Perka in sixth, Tim Slade in seventh. Good to see both BJR cars in the same uh, vicinity of each other. Cameron Waters in eighth, Rick Kelly in ninth, and Anton Di Pasquale in tenth, the first of the rookies. Good job to him. That's your top ten. The rest of the field was Andre Heimgartner. Richie Stanaway in twelfth. He had a great qualifying session on both days, actually. Uh, Lee Holdsworth also not doing anywhere near as poorly as um, as the rest of the year. He has, he's had a pretty uh, pretty shocking year, to be honest. Um, and he made a bit of a bounce back in New Zealand. And by bounce back, I mean he didn't finish in 20 if he finished in uh, within the top 15 in qualifying. So, you know, that's not great. But it's good news to see them coming back, especially since there'll be more news involving Lee Holdsworth's Team 18 uh, at the end of the of the uh, podcast concerning one concerning one Mark Winterbottom, so stay tuned for that. Um, in, uh, in, speaking of Mark Winterbottom, he's in 14th behind Lee Holdsworth. James Courtney and Scott Pye behind him, followed by Michael Caruso. Craig Lowndes in 18th, not doing so well. Fabian Coulthard in 19th, way down the order. Uh, Garth Tanner in 20th, Jack LeBock in 21st, Will Davison in 22nd, Tim Blanchard in 23rd, James Golding in 24th, Todd Hazelwood in 25th, and Simona in 26th, like I said, with a red flag to her name, which of course means that her fastest lap is removed, and she starts at the back of the grid. So that was qualifying, not a huge amount happened, it's only a 20 minute session, so let's just move right on into the race results and it was Shane Van Gisbergen in first place who narrowed down the margin to Scott McLaughlin who finished in second place to only two points in the championship. What a fight we're going to have all the way up to the end of the season. Um, it's going to be so close in the last few races. I am so excited to watch it, to see what goes down. It's going to be so good. Chaz Moster in third, David Reynolds in fourth, and Jamie Winkup in fifth. Scott Pye in sixth, making up ten spots. Great job from him. Cameron Waters in seventh, Nick Percat in eighth, James Courtney in ninth, Michael Caruso in tenth. Another good job from him to finish in tenth spot. Uh, Craig Lowndes in eleventh, Tim Blanchard in twelfth, up eleven spots. Good drive from him. Mark Winterbottom. James Golding up 10 spots to finish 14th. Lee Holdsworth, Rick Kelly, Tim Slade, Andre Heimgardner, Anton Di Pasquale, Will Davison, Simona, Jack LeBrock, Richie Stanaway unfortunately dropping 11 spots and finishing in 23rd. Todd Hazelwood and Garth Tender and not classified Fabian Coulthard after he was crashed out of the race by what I think is fair to say was Richie Stanaway. Um... Stanaway runs into the back of Holdsworth, actually, coming into the last section of turns. Those very fast left and right handers. And uh, Holdsworth, given an extra push from Stanaway, runs into the side of Coulthard, and Coulthard barrels into the fence. 
in what was a pretty nasty nasty accident. It's a very high speed part of the circuit. Um, Stanaway was given a penalty, and which he complained about, and I'm not quite sure why because it was very definitely his fault. <laughs> um, so um, there's that. Unfortunately for Stanaway, another poor result from him, and a poor result from Coulthard as well. Um, even to have him be battling down there in the order in a DJR car, battling down and below the top 10 um, when his teammate is in first and second most weekends is disappointing to see from Coulthard. I haven't been very impressed with him this season at all. But let's go into the controversies for this race because there was a lot. Saturday saw quite a few incidents happen, all of them involving Shane and Scott. And let's go into the... Let's just do them in chronological order. The first thing that happened that was uh, noteworthy is that Scott comes in for his pit stop. They leave Shane out for longer. Um, Scott makes up some ground, but eventually his tires fade. Shane comes in the pit, comes out behind Scott, and his tires are newer, so he has, he has more grip and is eventually able to pass him. So a few things happen. While Shane is in his pit stop, his wheels do... Well, they do two rotations. They rotate a little bit once because he engaged the clutch. That's legal. They also rotate again when uh, as they're lowering the jacks on his car, presumably because he's depressed the clutch and started to accelerate before the car has hit the ground. Now, that is illegal. That's against the rules. And the rules, as they are worded, and I forget the exact wording, but the ex the wording is that there cannot be rotation of the wheel. Um, now, this is, this is a point that's come up before. There have been a lot of penalties given out to rotating wheels in a pit stop. Um... I believe David Reynolds was given a penalty for it at Bathurst. He had a drive-through penalty. And normally, a wheel rotation in pit lane is a drive-through penalty. No questions asked. That is what happens. Had Shane been given a drive-through penalty, he would have finished... Um, let's see. Pit lane transit was about 45 seconds. So if he had to drive through pit lane while everybody else got to drive past him at full speed... He would have finished. He would have finished in about. Oh, just going down the order. He would have finished very far down. Um, he would have finished at about twenty-first or twenty-second. Had he been given a forty-five-second penalty, um, obviously putting him not out of championship contention, but severely severely harming his championship prospects for the next three races after this one, after the Saturday events. Um, so during the race, um, they did not give him a penalty. They resolved to work it out post-race, which usually means that they don't have enough data to solve a problem um, or make a decision accurately um, and when they're dealing with something as big as a championship fight uh, I can understand I can understand this um, I think that was a fine call because it's very easy to add time to someone else's race post race or you, you just increment some numbers it's not hard um, so I didn't have a problem with that at the time um, but what they did end up doing was ruling no penalty. So Shane got to keep his first place position after he won it. Um, and a lot of people aren't happy with that. Um, after I watched the video a few times and his wheel doesn't make a full 360 degree rotation. It doesn't go all the way around. Um, I think it goes less than half before it stops again. So it's a very short rotation. Um, but the rules doesn't say that there's any rotation allowed. Um, the rules only state that you cannot have any wheel rotation. It, the argument now comes from what is defined as a rotation. 
and how much leeway is given before something is considered to be rotating. Um, if you don't know, the reason why this rule is in place is to protect uh, the pit crew, because if they're trying to change a tyre, that sort of thing, and a wheel starts rotating on them, well, it could, it could seriously hurt them. It could break their arms, they could break their fingers, they, you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, so it's understandable they're not allowed to do it. Um, but where things get fuzzy is in situations like this, where the wheel has rotated a little bit and the car is on its way down, so the pit stop was done, um, and no one was standing near it, but the rules don't have a clause in them saying that any of that is fine. The rules only state that the wheel must not rotate while it's up on the jacks, which it did. Um, so, of course, DJR protested the decision, and the protest was dismissed because... Um, I have a quote here, actually. So this is from the... This is from the stewards. The stewards. There we go. Said it right that time. Um, so this is from the stewards. So... Um, basically... I'll try and, I'm just trying to sum it up here. But basically, uh, one quote here. There's a couple of reasons why they didn't give him a penalty. One of those arguments is that this is in line with previous decisions that they've made involving wheel rotation at a pit stop. In particular, um, we agree with the deputy race director that we have termed the second movement, uh, which is the, the rotation in question of Shane's car, Shane's rear wheels in its second pit stop in race 28, the Saturday race, is comparable to the incidents involving car 9, which is David Reynolds, at the Adelaide 500 and Bathurst races, which had not been penalised. Um, I find this one really interesting because I don't remember Adelaide, um, but I very I do remember David getting a penalty for his wheels rotating. I'm pretty sure that's what it was for. He definitely served a drive through penalty. Um, and if it wasn't for wheel rotation, I'm not sure what it, w what it was for. Um, but I... I was fairly certain that, without having to go back and look at it, I was fairly certain that he was given a penalty for that. Um, but, continuing forward, the second reason it looks like they've given it, the, the dismissal, is because, and I quote, it is clear that the wheels could not have rotated unless there was some degree of clutch engagement. However, we accept in the circumstances where 20% throttle had been applied, the movement is not consistent with full engagement of the clutch, potentially only minor engagement with no input from the driver. Rule D 11.8.8 .8 does not require a positive step by the driver to engage the clutch. However, the fact that there is no evidence available to us to assess the degree of engagement or whether the clutch pedal had been lifted supports the application of the DRD's, the Deputy Race Director's policy, with respect to these types of incidents. In other words, the absence of such data justifies a tolerance of the order the Deputy Race Director has applied. So basically what this means is that the rules do not state... The rules only state, so here it says that the rules do not require a positive action taken by the driver to operate the clutch in a wheel rotation case. But their argument for not giving a penalty is that it falls in line with previous decisions and that there is no evidence available to the degree of engagement in which Shane applied the clutch pedal. So in other words, what this is saying is that if they had proof that Shane had purposely pressed the clutch pedal and the wheels had spun because of that, then there would be a penalty given. So the fact that there is no evidence that he pressed the clutch is what they're writing off to dismiss this uh, this complaint. Um, and it justifies, in their words, the tolerance that they've given that there should be no penalty for this incident. I honestly don't know how I feel about this one. Um, on one hand, I'm really glad that we've got a really close championship fight still. I'm really happy that there has been tolerance applied um, because it means that the championship fight's going to go right down to the wire. We're going to get some really close, exciting racing. On the other hand, though, it seems pretty obvious to me that it is a penalty. His wheels rotate. The wheels do not state how much they rotate. 
the rules the rules do not state there needs to be a full wheel rotation only the wheels must be rotating for a penalty to be given they cannot rotate at all and the fact that there is no proof that he pressed pressed the clutch pedal shouldn't justify any tolerance because in their own statement the rules do not require the driver to engage the clutch in order for there to be a penalty involved um I mean, and there's no evidence that sh- there should be ele- evidence, surely. Surely they would have some telemetry or some data from the race indicating when he pressed the pedals. That's pretty basic monitoring stuff for racing cars. It- they should have an ability to see when he pressed a pedal at what time. This is usually cars can do this. Um, yeah, I'm really of two minds about it. I can't, I cannot. Part of me wants there to not be a penalty for this, and there wasn't, so I guess that part of me is happy because we get a better championship this way. But the other part of me is now upset that we're going to have a championship that if Shane wins, people are going to bring this up and say that he cheated or that Triple Eight paid off the stewards, all that sort of thing. And it's really going to muddy the championship and it's going to make it seem like it was won in a dirty fashion which I'm not a fan of either. I want good, clean, hard racing up until the end. And unfortunately, um, it just seems that we've lost one of those things. Either the championship was going to go down, was going to go more towards Scott, and Shane still could have won. Yes, but it would have been a lot harder for him. Um, Or we get a championship that's being muddied by controversy, which is the direction that we've gone in. Um... I wasn't there. I don't have access to all the data that they had. But to me, watching the broadcast and watching the same video and reading the same rules that they had, I assume, um, it looks to me like it did deserve to be a penalty. Um, But there isn't really any use talking about whether or not it deserved to be a penalty or not because it wasn't a penalty. But there was a penalty given to Shane because... Not long after he got out of the pits, he caught the back of Scott, and as they were coming through the hairpin, which is, don't, I have no idea what turn number it is, but as they were coming through the hairpin, there's only one, um, Shane tried to um, Shane tried to do a crisscross maneuver, so he tried to pull out wide and then cut in and apply the accelerator before Scott, so he has a better run out of the turn than Scott did, because Scott took a very narrow entry into the corner, in order to defend his line. So Shane pulls out wide, and he goes to turn in and slam the accelerator down, but he runs into the back of Scott, and this gave him a five-second penalty. Now, he doesn't bump into him and push him out of the way. He runs square into the back of him, and he damages his own car visibly, not not in any serious way, but the bonnet of the car is a bit crumpled up, and he hits him quite hard, too. Um, I didn't think this deserved a penalty so he was given a five second penalty and i thought initially that they gave him a five second penalty when i was watching it for the wheel rotation i thought they were going to give him the the lowest amount of penalty time they could just to keep the championship fight alive for them um and they were they i didn't even think of that as being an incident where he ran to the back of him because to me it looked pretty obvious that Shane attempted the crisscross and Scott went much slower than Shane expected. Perhaps Scott, I think Scott was aware that Shane would try the crisscross. And so he, instead of pulling out of the corner as fast as he could, he decided to slow up in the middle, preventing Shane from passing him through the inside because his car was still there. And Shane wasn't expecting this and simply ran straight into the back of him. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Watching it, At the time and watching it again now, um, I'm about 90% sure that's what happened. Um, And I was shocked when they gave him a penalty for that because how many times have we seen bump and runs not been penalized? You know, we see them all the time and that didn't unsettle Scott's car at all. It didn't seem intentional to me. Not that being intentional is a reason to not get a penalty. But, I mean, it's like when someone brake tests you. That's... you're not fined because you ran into them. Normally you would be, but if they stepped on the brakes and you ran into them because you had no chance to avoid them, then they get the fine. And that's, it's a similar situation to me. Not that I think Scott should have been 
penalised for it. No means he should have been penalised at all. But I don't think Shane deserved a penalty for not being able to react to something that he really shouldn't have expected to happen. Um... I don't think there's any reasonable way you could have expected Shane not to run into the back of him, especially if... I mean, obviously, I don't have access to, to Scott's data, but I'm pretty confident in saying that he did slow down through the corner. That's what it looks like to me. I don't think Shane would have ran to the back of Scott for no reason. He's trying to go past him, not, not crash him. <laughs> um, so... I don't know. I wasn't a fan of that one, but it was only five seconds, which led to a great race at the end when Shane had already passed Scott. He was two and a half seconds clear when he gets the call that he's been given a five second penalty and he's told to put in qualifying laps for the last, I think, four or five laps of the race. And he absolutely guns it and he makes it out to 5.2 seconds before crossing the line, meaning that he really only finished the race two tenths ahead of Scott McLaughlin. He absolutely killed it in those last stages of the race. And then, and then we move on to controversy number three. Because <laughs> there was three somehow. Um, Shane does a burnout, celebrates his victory because he's closed the gap down to two points as far as he's aware. He wasn't even aware that his wheels did spin, I don't think, during the pit stop. So as far as he knows, he's good. And... He drives into victory lane, into Park for me, and parks behind his board and doesn't give Scott enough room to get out of his car. So he parks him in, basically. Um, uh, so <laughs> this one's so hard to analyze because it really comes down to whether or not Shane did it on purpose. And obviously he says he didn't, but no driver in their right mind would confess to doing that on purpose. Um, really, there's a couple of things we need to look at. I think, obviously Scott was upset, but he's such a sportsman-like guy, and he's so good that he didn't even, he didn't even verbally, he didn't even verbalize how angry he was. He clearly was upset, but he didn't say anything um, terribly bad. Um, at the post-race interview or at the press conference afterwards. He was very sportsmanlike. Um, he's great for this sport, honestly. <laughs> you can't go wrong with Scott. He's such a good guy. Um, I have no idea if Shane did it on purpose. I really don't. I spent the last couple of days re-watching it, analyzing it, seeing what he said and how he said it. and I cannot work out for the life of me if he did it on purpose or not. Um, part of me thinks he didn't do it on purpose. Um, he would have been really happy that he came in first place and closed the championship so much. Um, and that's obvious. You can see from the onboard camera and the fact that he jumps out of the car and starts celebrating straight away that he is pretty focused on that. And, um, I mean, there's no consideration. You can watch the onboard camera before he jumps out and he doesn't look at Scott or anything. He just celebrates and then jumps out. Um, the other piece of evidence that you can use to suggest that he didn't notice is that he does actually park in front of the board. So each first, second, and third all have to park in front of uh, a board for each position they're in. So a little stand. One, the first place one has a one on it, and a two, and a three, and so on. Um, and Shane, they all park with the board in the middle of the car. And Shane does the same thing. He parks with the board in the middle of the car. Um... Which is something I didn't notice before until um, until today as I was researching for this podcast. And this is the one piece of evidence that makes me think maybe, maybe he didn't do it on purpose. Because he does park dead center into the middle of the board. Um, so it's possible that he just aimed for the board and then got out. He didn't even think about the cars that are around him. On the other hand, how is his peripheral vision so bad that he didn't realize that Scott was directly to his left and wouldn't be able to get out? I know he would have been excited. I know that he parked behind the board and everything, and maybe it's the marshal's fault for putting the board, uh, the boards too close together. But surely Shane should have some uh, spatial awareness about that sort of thing. He's a racing driver. That's what he does. He <laughs> drives cars around. 
Um, he should have some kind of awareness that he's too close to the car next to him. Um, it's so hard to call. It really is. It's one of the hardest things I've had to call um, watching motorsport. I honestly have no idea. Um, I'd really like to give him the benefit of the doubt. I like Shane, but on the other hand, Shane's a really hard racer, and normally that only applies to on-track stuff. We've seen him pull some, shall we say, controversial moves on people. Um, His spin on Reynolds... Uh, at Phillip Island is one that comes to example. I'm sure you can think of other ones. He's had a lot of controversial moves in the past. He's a very hard racer. The thing is, is that normally this only applies to his racing. He doesn't normally do stuff after to anyone after that, and he doesn't really participate in mind games. Um, it's really hard to call. It really is. Um, if I was Scott, he took it really well. If I was Scott, I wouldn't have taken it that well. <laughs> I've got to say, I would have I would have done something. Um, he did eventually get out of the car, not until after they pulled his car backwards, though, so he could actually jump out of the door. Because um, there literally wasn't enough room for him to get out. So, I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments, um, because I'm at a loss. I really can't figure out if he did it on purpose. I hope he didn't. I hope he didn't do it on purpose, but there's also a reasonable amount of doubt to suggest that he did do it on purpose, so... You know, let me know in the comments what you think. Um, but that was only race 28, the Saturday race. What about um, the Sunday race? Well, not as controversial, luckily, as a Saturday race. or as Otherwise, I'd have a two-hour long podcast. But let's get into the qualifying results. Now, this one does have a top 10 shootout after qualifying. So the top 10 order is subject to change. But it was David Reynolds in first, followed by Scott in second, Shane in third, Jamie Winkup in fourth, Chaz Moster in fifth, Fabian Coulthard, much better performance from him in sixth, Anton Di Pasquale, a great qualifying from him in seventh, Richie Stanaway in the top 10. It was so good to see him there. I've been saying all year that Richie is much better than he's been able to show because he's been in a team that, let's be honest, hasn't been at the pointy end of the competition all year. And he's been a rookie. He's been forced to fight in that mid in that mid to lower field. Of course, he's not going to do well. He has no ex- he has zero almost zero experience in supercars, and he's in a team with a car that he can't. He's in a let's be honest, a crap car at the back of the field fighting other drivers who are trying to make position they're making mistakes and sometimes he just gets caught up in that and it's totally understandable he's had good results at winton he did well in here he's qualified really well and i think this proves that richie with the right setup can drive well really well he was right up there in qualifying on both days but i will have more to talk to him about with the race results um Cameron Waters in 9th, Andre Heimgartner in 10th, that was your top 10 shootout, and a great job from Heimgartner, he was the best of the Nissans pretty much all weekend, and also, I'm pretty sure every New Zealander on the field made it into the top 10 shootout, which is incredible, there's, there's a thing, I think there's 5 of them, just going back through the, uh, the field, yeah, I'm pretty sure every single New Zealander made it into the top 10 shootout, which was crazy for the New Zealand race, so it was really good to see that. Um, as for the rest of the field, remember that only the top 10 go to the top 10 shootout. The rest of them will start in the positions they, in the positions they qualify in, which means that Lowndes is in 11th. Another not-so-great qualifying result from him. Tim Slade in 12th, Nick Perka in 13th, Mark Winterbottom in 14th, Tim Blanchard, a good result again from him in 15th, Simona in 16th, not bad from her, considering where the performance of the other Nissans, Rick Kelly in 17th, Lee Holsworth in 18th, Michael Caruso in 19th, Scott Pye in 20th, James Courtney in 21st, the Walkinshaw cars really not doing well at New Zealand, Will Davison in 22nd, Garth Tander in 23rd, James Golding in 24th, Jack LeBrock in 25th, and Todd Hazelwood rounding out the grid in 26th position. So let's move into the top 10 shootout. What was the grid like for the top 10 cars? Well, just like I did with the other 
uh, top 10 shootouts. I'm going to do it in reverse order. So, who was in 10th? It was Andre Heimgartner once again with a kind of slow lap compared to everybody else. Um, but that's fine. It's a top 10 shootout. I think it might have been his first one. So, not a bad result from him just to make it into the top 10, especially considering where the other Nissans were anyway. Uh, Cameron Waters in 9th, Anton Di Pasquale in 8th, and Richie Stanaway in 7th. Good qualifying from both of them. They put in really good laps. Fabian Coulthard in 6th, David Reynolds in 5th, Chaz Mostert in in 4th, Shane Van Gisbergen in 3rd, Scott McLaughlin in 2nd, and Jamie Winkup in 1st, with Scott splitting both the Red Bull cars. We were set for an intense race. And it was a pretty good race. And I will go over the results right now. Scott McLaughlin, first place from Shane Van Gisbergen, who finished in second after a late race swap between Jamie and Shane. So Jamie Winkup was in second place right behind Scott McLaughlin. He actually looked really racy. He looked like he might have been able to pass him, given the proper opportunity. Um... And Shane was in third place, 11 seconds behind. And on the last lap, uh, team orders were produced to tell Jamie to slow down and let Shane take him, take second place from him, which did happen. Obviously, a lot of people weren't happy with this. Um, it really depends on how you feel about team orders. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Red Bull, Holden Racing Team, they're a team. They've got two drivers plus Leon, so three drivers on their team. And team orders are a part of the sport. I know there is a rule somewhere that says that you can't use team orders in supercars, but they've been using team orders all season, so I'm not entirely sure if they're bothered to enforce that one. Um, but this is the advantage you get from having a team with two drivers that are up near the top. You can help each other out. Um, which is why it's disappointing to see Kulta down the order so often, because he hasn't been able to help Scott in almost any way. Um... But it was, it's again, it's another thing that you're always two minds about. You want to see the best driver win. You want to see them come in the positions that they deserve to be in. And Jamie deserved to be, to be first or second. He really did. He put in a great race. Um, they compromised his strategy quite a bit just so Shane wouldn't be blocked by him in the case of a safety car. Um, and it didn't work out for either of them um, because Shane's, because Jamie's, Strategy was compromised. He ended up behind Scott with weaker tires than his. Um, and because no safety car ever happened, um, Shane's strategy was compromised as well because they decided to leave him out for long up behind traffic. It just didn't play out for either of them. Um, so not the greatest strategy decisions from Red Bull. And it's a shame that Jamie didn't get to come second in the place that he probably deserved to be in. But... To be fair to the guy, he's got seven championships. He's barely in the running for this one. Mathematically, he can still win the championship this year. Um, but it would take Shane and Scott DNFing from both races, the both the next two coming races, not getting any points at all for Jamie to be able to win the championship. So um, in that sense, he's really, really pretty much out of the championship. He's more than a whole race win behind both of them. Um, and at that point, when you are behind your teammate, you help your teammate out. One of them's in the championship fight. So it's time for Jamie to help Shane win the championship, just like how Shane helped Jamie last year. That's just part of what it means to be in a team. On the other hand, though, you do understand where the frustrations come from. But... Again, let me know in the comments what you think about team orders, whether or not they should be there, and whether or not it's right to use them. Um, I personally think it's okay. Um, in this instance, had Jamie been winning the race um, and Shane was in second and they told him to swap, it would be a different story. A race win is much more special than a podium finish. But it wasn't like that. It was just second and third swapping. And I'm more okay with that than a race win even if the distance between them was a little ridiculous. Craig lands in fourth. Great drive from him, followed by David Reynolds. Craig put a great pass on David towards the end of the race. He made some great, great moves towards the end. 
Um, Chaz Moster in six, Fabian Coulthard in seventh, Andre Heimgartner in eighth, Mark Winterbottom up five spots to ninth, Nick Perka in tenth, Tim Slade in eleventh, Cameron Waters in twelfth, Garth Tander up ten spots to thirteenth, Lee Holdsworth in fourteenth, Scott Pye in fifteenth, James Courtney in sixteenth, Michael Caruso in seventeenth, Simona in eighteenth, Will Davison in nineteenth, Richie Stanaway in twentieth. <laughs> James Golding in 21st, Rick Kelly in 22nd, Jack LeBrock in 23rd, Anton D. Pasquale in 24th after a first turn, uh, first lap incident, Todd Hazelwood in 25th, and Blim, bleh, Blim, Tim Blanchard in 26th after he retired early from the race. Um, he went long enough to be classified, but he was out on lap 60 with mechanical issues. Richie Stanaway was running an okay race. And then they brought him in for his first pit stop and they uh, failed to put the wheel on properly, which was okay because they were still putting in fuel the whole time. So he wasn't compromised too much, but he did come out behind in the pack. And then he made mistake after mistake after mistake and fell back down through the order. I was so disappointed to see this happen. Um, I've been saying all year that Richie's a good driver and that he deserves a chance and that people give him too much too much uh they're not giving him enough slack for uh being in a, a bit of a dodgy car and being a new guy in the sport it's hard to be new to a sport and be in a not great car that's hard to deal with um and unfortunately for stan away um i was really excited to see him up in the top 10 i thought he's racing with good drivers nice clean drivers this should be the chance that he needs to prove himself and finish high up in the race and he bottled it. He absolutely bottled it, and I can't defend him anymore. They were all of his mistakes were his own. He did. I think he made two mistakes. I think he locked up under brakes, um, not even with cold tires. He just locked up, and then he put it out on the grass on the final turn and nearly lost the car completely. Um, I think there might have been something else. I think he might have gone off the track at turn at turn three after the chicane, but maybe that was the Saturday race. Um, but either way, no matter how you slice it, um, Andre Heimgartner managed to finish in 8th. He started in 10th. Coulthard started in the top 10. Mostert started in the top 10. Reynolds started in the top 10. Winkup started in the top 10. Shane started in the top 10. Scott started in the top 10. Most of the people who started in the top 10 finished near the top 10 or in it. Um, the only exception being Anton, who had a first first lap incident, which put him all the way back down in the order. And um, Rich, except for Richie, um, pretty much all the mistakes were his own, and it's really disappointing. And clearly, I'm not the only person who thinks this because, in the news portion of things, Richie Stanaway might not be in for a seat next year, unfortunately. So, we'll talk more about that in a second, though. In terms of the championship, though, this means that the points gap between Scott McLaughlin and Shane Van Gisbergen is exactly the same as when they went into this round at 14 points difference. 14 points. So this means that if Scott comes in first... Well, if Scott comes... Scott needs to finish ahead of Shane the next two races to uh, win the championship. That's all he needs to do. He needs to finish ahead of Shane. Shane needs... If Shane comes first in the next race and Scott comes third or lower, he will be winning the championship. That's how close this is. So it can't be a 1-2, Shane and then Scott. It needs to be a 1 and then at least third or more back. But that's how close this is. It is so close now. So close. Um... Oh, God, I just, I'm just so excited, looking forward to Newcastle, the final round, which is soon. I'm just so excited to, to see these two guys go head-to-head. Scott for his first championship and Shane for his second one. I'm so excited to see who's going to win that. Let me know who you think is going to win, obviously, in the comments. And let's talk about Newcastle. So when is it? Well... It is on the 23rd of November to the 25th of November in roughly three weeks' time. There will be a qualifying, a race, 
on Saturday and then qualifying top 10 shooter and another race on Sunday. And the championship is going to go right down to that race. Race number 31 will be the deciding race of the championship. It will be the last race. So make sure you don't miss that. It's going to be so good. So good. But we've talked about the race results. We've talked about the controversies. What else is there to talk about? Well, we've got the news. And the first piece of news is that Triple Eight have sealed the team's championship already with one round to go. So this is what I was talking about with Coulthard not being on top of his game. They're one round. We've got one, two races left to race, and they've already got the championship. They could both DNF both races, and there's no way anyone else would be able to win. Um, I've got a Scott's done his job a hundred percent. He's been on top of it, and you can see that because he's winning the championship. Shane and Jamie have done their jobs as well. They're in second and third in the championship. You can't get much better than second and third unless you're first and second. Fabian's in... Well, Fabian's in, is in um, seventh, I think. Off the top of my head. I'll just check it. Yeah, he's in seventh. He's 1,206 points behind Scott McLaughlin. He's behind Chaz Mostert, David Reynolds, and Craig Lowndes in the championship. With Scott Pye only 40 points down. And Rick Kelly only 70 points down. This is where... Fabian has been performing between Chaz Moster, who's been in probably one of the worst cars on the grid this year. Um, no offense to Tickford fans, but it really has been appalling aside from these last few races. Um, and in front of Scott Pye, who has been in what has been a very inconsistent Walkinshaw Andretti car. That's where he is. He's in one of the best cars on the field, and he's down in seventh in the championship. And I'm sorry if you're a fan of Fabian Coulthard or DJR or whatever, um, but I just don't see it. I just think that this seat could go to someone much more talented than Fabian. I think he's had his chance to prove what he can do, and I think he's bottled it. Um, I don't know who else would would go to this seat though um silly season in full swing uh, maybe Winterbottom could go there because there is a lot of news about Winterbottom and where he's going to be in the future because Mark Winterbottom is leaving Tickford Racing let's just go to that right now um after being at what used to be four performance racing which turned into Tickford Racing for 13 years Mark Winterbottom is moving to a different team which is speculated to be team 18 you never heard of Team 18? They're the ones that Lee Holdsworth's been racing for since 2016. They're going to be a two-car team um, with Mark Winterbottom driving one of those cars. And it's interesting that his reason for leaving Tickford is that, um, as he states, that the team hasn't been performing well enough and he wants to move to a, a better performing car. So it's interesting that he's moving to Team 18, a car that has been in, at best, the midfield this year. Um, and at worst, right at the back of the field. Um, Lee Holdsworth's had a pretty terrible season. Um, it'll be interesting to see with Winterbottom there, whether or not it is the car or if it is Holdsworth himself that's the problem. Um... But it is exciting to see a driver as who has been around as long as Winterbottom, who has been at one team for as long as Winterbottom has, to go to a different team. I honestly thought he would stay at Tickford, especially with the Mustangs coming in next season. I thought he'd want to stay. But it turns out he's moving. He wants to move. So that's very interesting news from him. Honestly shocked. Honestly shocked. Um that he would want to move. But it makes for a very interesting next season, so that'll be one to watch. Keep an eye on Team 18 Racing. We'll see where that one goes in the future. Um, I already talked about Stanaway uh, leaving Tickford. Um, he's on a two-year contract, um, but uh, it's speculated that there are some performance clauses in that contract, which he very potentially might not be meeting. Um, and I really... I was going to say, I really don't think it's his fault, but the race at Pukekohe on Sunday kind of confirmed that maybe it is a little bit his fault. Um, 
I think he's got a lot to prove. I think he's a good driver. Um, I don't think he's as bad as this year has let on. Um, but he could have done better. He could have done himself some more favors, that's for sure. And it's disappointing to see. I'll be really, I will be upset if he's gone from the grid because I think he can offer a lot. I think he's a genuinely um, a really good talent. I really do. And um, I think he just needs to be put in a car that enables him to grow and position himself in the field where he's not constantly fighting and getting into accidents and collisions and things like that. I think he spends a little... I think his race craft could do a little bit of improving. I think he's a little bit too physical. Or other people are too physical with him. I'm not sure. But he could do with just hanging back, just hanging out, keeping a clean race, and I think he might surprise us all. I would be I would be upset if he was gone from the grid next year. But I can't say I would blame Tickford. He hasn't been up there performing when the other Tickford cars have. Um, towards the end of the year, yes, the Tickford cars have been pretty woeful most of the year. But in the last few races, they've really picked up those cars. And Chaz has been has finished in the podium a few times. Um, and Stanaway has been nowhere. He's been finishing back down the end of the field just like he has before. And I'm more willing to put that on the fact that he's in a a uh, subpar car and they're probably not giving him all the resources that he needs to succeed. There's four cars in that garage. Um, I mean, for instance, Mark Winterbottom, who we know is a good driver. He's a champion winner. He's won a championship not very long ago, either three years ago, he won a championship um, he hasn't been doing very well in Tickford either, so there is a lot to su- suggest that it's the car more than it, than more than it is it is him. But on the other hand, he hasn't really had the race results to back that up, even when he has had a good qualifying position like he did on the weekend. So that's unfortunate for him. And the last piece of news that I have for this podcast is that Jamie Winkup has once again been fined for a post-race breach. Last time, if you'll remember, at the bend, he was fined for dropping a champagne bottle off the podium. This time, he's been fined $2,000 for driving his car into pit lane instead of driving it into the Park for May victory lane area after the race was over. He then also drove the car out of pit lane and into the victory lane area, but he was still given a $2,000 fine for driving into the pits. Um, (laughs) Not sure why. (laughs) Not sure why this is a fine. The champagne bottle one, you could kind of say like, yeah, it's a bit of a safety hazard. Yeah, it might bonk someone on the head. They might get knocked unconscious. That sort of thing. A full bottle of champagne is pretty heavy. Um... Why on earth is there a fine for him driving into pit lane and then driving out of it again? (laughs) It's not like he sat there for 20 minutes and ignored everybody when they told him to go into victory lane. He just drove out after he realized he made a mistake. I don't know why he deserves a penalty for that. Um, Supposedly, the stewards imposed a harsher fine on him because it's the second time he's had a post-race breach of procedure. Um... But it is a little ridiculous to give someone a $2,000 fine because they drove into the wrong area for one second and then drove back out of it again. I didn't even see it on the broadcast. That was how fast he did it. Um, so, unlucky for Winker. But didn't seem to bother him any. He's still got that smile on his face, um, which is always good to see. Um, I already talked about Newcastle. Let me know if you're going to be there. It was a great race last year, full of controversy. Uh, hopefully, we don't get people as we people aren't as mad uh, uh, this year as they were last year with Scott. Um, and also, tell me who you think is going to win the championship, and tell me who you want to win the championship. Um, I personally just love seeing this fight go down to the wire. I am super excited for Newcastle for both races. It's going to be great to watch these two guys fight it out because I honestly believe, I really do believe that Scott and Shane are two of the best drivers that this series has ever seen. And it's going to be fantastic watching them, not just this year, but the next 
almost the next decade even, watching these two guys fight out for championships time and time again. It's going to be fantastic to see that. And I am super looking forward to not just the next round in Newcastle to see who wins the championship, but to see who wins the championship next year. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be so close, and I'm just super excited. We've got more teams making progress. The Mustangs are coming in next year. Um, hopefully we see the Walkinshaw and Andretti cars up there. Hopefully we see the Nissan cars up there. That would be nice. Um, it'd be interesting to see where Mark Winterbottom goes. And I've got so many questions for you guys. Tell me what you think Mark Winterbottom's going to, how he's going to do in his new team. Um, tell me who you think is going to win the championship in Newcastle. Um, ooh, what else? Tell me if you think, tell me if you would drop Fabian Coulthard or not from the DJR lineup. And if so, who would you replace in that car? Who would you like to see line up with Scott McLaughlin next year at DJR Racing? And, um, actually, that's everything. That's everything. Um, don't really have any more questions to ask. I ran out of questions. <laughs> I'm all questioned out. Um, it'll be good to see some new drivers come through next year. It'll also be good to see um, drivers like, I'm looking forward to seeing Anton really develop as a driver at Erebus. I think he's had a really good first season with a few mistakes, um, which is to be expected when you're a rookie driver. But he's an example of a guy who's been put in a good car and he's really taken advantage of it. He's had, I think, two top 10 shootout appearances this year. So he's pretty good at qualifying. I think his race craft is lacking a little bit. Um, but this is all stuff that will come in time. So there we go. There's another question. Let me know who you think the best rookie on the field is at the moment. Um, the rookies, if you need reminding, are Anton, Jack LeBrock. Sorry. Anton Di Pasquale. Jack LeBrock and Richie Stanaway. And I think Todd Hazelwood... No, Todd Hazelwood... No, Todd Hazelwood's raced before. He's just in an old car, um, confusingly. Um, oh, and James Golding is a rookie. I always forget about James Golding. Sorry, buddy. Um, tell me out of those four who you think is the best rookie on the grid at the moment. Um, and I will see you... In the next episode of the Viet Supercars Fancast, when I report on what happens at the event in Newcastle. Who is going to win the championship? One round to go. See you then.